pay attention to Ryan. I race it with Ryan three times a week, and he's always making good choices. So I totally pay attention to Ryan, and I uh, have no qualms about saying that. You know, when Andy Burdick races with us, I pay attention to what he does on the course, and so I always think it's good to pay attention to the sailors' respect. Uh, for sure, starts. Uh, clean starts, and I, uh, I, was, I, I give myself two line sights, a sight that puts me about a boat length back from the line, and a sight of what the line is, and I try my very best to pretend I'm starting alone in the middle of the line and not worry about any other boats, and I try to be up at that one boat length sight, and um, if anyone wants more explanation of that, I'd be happy to draw it out on a whiteboard if there is one. But the two sites, and really try to um, pretend I'm, uh, try to not get uh, stressed out by the other boats around me and just start my best for myself was, uh, was, was great. All four of my starts, I had clean air right off the, right from the get-go. Ryan, you're next. Yeah, my key success factor sailing at uh, Nagawaki here, so I grew up sailing here, so I sailed a bunch, uh, and it's here is just like any other small lake. Uh, it's going to be very shifty, and it's going to be spotty, so it's going to be wind holes, and there's going to be puffs out there. Um, and so my key success factor is stay in the breeze, so stay out of the wind holes and go and find the puffs. You're gonna get. You're gonna go faster in the puffs, and you're gonna get better sailing angles if you're tacking on on the edges of your puffs out here. Um, and then also uh, make sure you're sailing uh, on the lifted tack. So what I like to do when I'm sailing out there, uh, like before the race, I just like to sail up wind on one tack, and then I like to sail through the entire oscillation a couple times and see, okay, what's my best uh, sailing angle and then what's my worst sailing angle for this tack and try to remember that during the race uh, and make sure I'm sailing the best angle that we've seen in the last hour for that starboard tack, make sure I'm on starboard tack when that angle's happening and that I know uh, when to not be on starboard tack when I'm not seeing uh, that angle. So. so you have a compass? Uh, or just I, don't, do I don't use a compass. You just Some use people a use a compass for that. You can be more scientific and measure. Um, I just kind of eyeball it. Um, awesome. Uh, next. I guess I'll go next. I had three things that I really looked at. Um, the first one was sailing the pressure and keeping the boat moving all the time. And that, that was my big deal. And, and you know, it, it seemed to me like there were shifts out there, and especially the earlier races in the day, it was more of a staying in the pressure. Now the last race of the day, there was more pressure everywhere. But that was a big one, keep the boat moving. Um, the other thing was watching other people. I, I sailed around Bill a little bit and he was ripping past me in the last race, I got a chance to be ahead of him and use some of the stuff that he was using on me the races before and made <laughs> my boat go through the lake faster and, and get up and I was able to keep him away. Yeah, and then, example? well, yes. the Traveler was the big deal. The Traveler, when it, it got breezy for, you know, for the little guys, it got breezy that last race. And so we were banging hard and Cunningham hard and, you know, and I was sheeting hard and then I would let a little bit out to let the boat roll, but then I was, and I never played the Traveler unless I had two people on and it's super breezy or, you know, super wavy, but I was dumping some Traveler and, and that kept the boat down and kept me moving through the water. So, you know, like, like Bill said, watching other people, that's the best way to learn stuff is what are other people doing, especially when they go past you, you know, what did they just do to me? And then the other thing is, We've been to three regattas so far this year. The first one was down in Indy, beginning of the year, early June, and it was hot on a pistol. And yesterday was that way. And I, in one of the races, man, overheated, didn't have enough water, and just my brain faded. And I had a brain fade yesterday in the third race, but staying hydrated and, you know, whenever I was in a place where I could drink water, I was doing that. Because it seemed like this year has been a real challenge with the heat. 
and we were out there a long time yesterday in the heat and, and you know stand protected as much as you can from the sun and still be comfortable and then drink it water and stuff so that, those were my three things to say Dan Vince Dan either one so uh, uh, I try and keep it real simple and for me that starts with a good start and that's the front row with space. I'm really not trying to be tight next to anybody. I used to think, well, where's all the rock stars uh, starting? I want to be next to them, but I really don't. I just want clear air. Like Bill said, if I can just make sure that I'm going fast at the, at the zero time, at the start, with clear air. So that's number one. If I then keep my boat going to the best speed, so it's bow down. I'm really trying not to pinch unless I have to. I often find myself getting sawed off by some of the boats that pinch a little more or head a little higher more frequently. So I'll, I might be one of the first guys to attack because I'm getting squeezed off by one of these four guys. But then I'm coming back right away because then my third point would be, my third point would be that I'm trying to be real uh, conservative to the best of my ability, which is where, for me, that means where the where's the fleet. I'm I'm not trying to get out to the edge, and I'm trying to stick with the group of boats that I'm next to and wait for mistakes to be made so that I can capitalize with the quick uh, move. Maybe they didn't react quick enough to the light shift that I saw, and so I got a couple feet that way. So so clear start, keep the bow down, going fast, real simple, and then. Uh, conservative, clean sailing. Awesome. And every now and then you'll get a big righty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> not, not too, not often enough. <laughs> yeah, you were in on that, Al. Yeah, it was beautiful. <laughs> Who was it that went, Yahoo, or whatever? Yeah, that, was the, that was Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Try to, I tried to kind of keep an eye on the oscillation out there yesterday. Obviously, there were some big persistent shifts once in a while, but I'm hoping those were not going to be too frequent and keep clocking. So once we had a big persistent shift, even I kind of try to make sure I get back in phase with the oscillation. And sometimes, you know, a lot of it was when I was back in the fleet a little bit. I was watching the other boats a little bit just to kind of keep an eye on who's got the breeze, and if they had the breeze, it's not necessarily going towards them. You almost want to go all the other way and try, try to get the next oscillation. And sometimes, mm -hmm. yesterday you couldn't see them. They were coming up over that shoreline. Obviously, that righty, you wouldn't know mm -hmm. it's there until you got over there, and you're just hoping that oscillation was going to occur at yes. about the right time. And, uh, you know, I'm piggybacking on like what Bill said earlier about, you know, keeping an eye on the, you know, some of the top guys in the fleet. And, uh, Ryan, for sure, you know, old Paul Laker, kind of one of the Nick Wicker guys. I kind of kept an eye on him, just you know, where would he be going? And I did split with him once or twice, but was you know, free, not not too frequently. You know, keep an eye on those guys, and even a little bit on the starting lines. I kind of keep an eye on where some of the where the top guys are starting on the line. You know, if I got them, just to see what's going on. Yeah. Do, do a little bit of that. Piggybacking off of Dan's comments about pressure, just to stay under pressure as it is. Mm -hmm. you know, especially once you got back in the back of the pressure. So, uh, Peter Keck, if you don't know him, is a Sea Scout National Champion several times, A Scout, part of an A Scout National Champion team. He's a awesome sailor, and he was out there yesterday. He's the arbitrator. Anything to add to what these guys said? I thought that there was a lot of good comments. Uh, I could add a couple things. I thought that the uh, hydration comments were really good, and if you can feel yourself overheating, it's a really good idea to dip your hat in the water or even get in the water and try and cool down your core temperature in between races. Um, and to, to go on Bill's points, you know, starting Starting obviously is super important in a big fleet like this with so many talented sailors, and I thought you did a really good job of explaining. I, are the pro starts legal in this class? They are. Aren't no, they? no, they're not. Nothing with GPS in it. Okay. 
because I did, I don't get to spectate a lot of races, but I enjoyed spectating yesterday, and there was a fair amount of line sag on three out of the four starts. So if, you know, if you can get a good line sight and try and, you know, go a little bit before the guy above you and the guy below you, that's going to help a lot in free, freeing up your air, but also letting you make choices on when to tack, because if you're going off the starting line on starboard tack, like 99% of the people, it's not always your lift attack. You may want to get to the port board as soon as possible. So to have the freedom to make that tack in the first shift is important. We, uh, we do this where I work. We talk about our failure resumes and mistakes we make. And um, Trump talking about it helps. So I think this is a great question. And there was a moment in race two where we were all coming off the line and Gid was cruising right in front of us on a port tack. And if someone's able to port tack the fleet within the first minute of the start, and it was, that means that the port shift is favored. And so we should all be flopping on the port. And I didn't. I watched him go. I was like, wow. <laughs> me for the race because you know and then the, then the starboard came and you were gone and um, and it, it is such an obvious indicator if someone is looking pretty on the tack that you're not on to tack <laughs> <laughs> and so that's that was that was my failure uh, failure of the day yesterday and, the, and, it's, and it's, I would say that that the, the middle of this fleet is very strong. So once you're once you once you're not in the front group, it's really hard to break out of it because everyone's going fast in the teens and the twenties. And so, um, so yeah, that's it. All right, Ryan, you don't have to answer. Move <laughs> <laughs> on to Dan. Yeah, I had a what did I have a seventeen, and I I really felt good. Sailed it, you know. Didn't, Good start, good first night. I was, I was behind. There were, I think I was in six. There were five guys in front of me, and then they got away a little bit off the breeze, and then there was me, and then there was a gap in the next people. So, coming up the next time, I felt like I was doing good. I was staying in pressure. I was kind of going with those guys, and all of a sudden, a big left hander came in, and I'm kind of in the middle, and I didn't get over to that. Well, it was kind of tactical payback because in a couple of races, I had kind of hung it out on the right side. And you know, just said I'm going to the right, and that's what I'm doing. So it was a payback for that. So I went downhill, lost both, and then coming up to the finish, kind of the same thing happened again. I didn't, you know, I didn't take what happened to me the first time, and I'm sitting there, and boats are flying in on both sides. So kind of a, you know, brain freeze on there. Um, but I was able to rebound. Like I said, it was crabby after that race, so I was able to rebound for the fourth. So it worked. Out. <laughs> so race three, I uh, was uh, had a great start, left of center line, and uh, felt really good. Breeze was fresh, and rode it for a couple minutes. Looked over my back, and there was 25 boats that had lifted up 25 degrees on a starboard above me, and I. My head was in the boat. I thought I was doing everything cool where I was at. I even confirmed I had good company. <laughs> and uh, so, but back to my point three on the first question, I was completely out of sync with being relatively conservative with all the boats. So I should attack as soon as I noticed it. I didn't. Uh, I wasn't looking. I didn't have my head on the swivel to to keep reaffirming that, oh gosh, they're really lifting, I got to get over there or pull out of what I'm doing. Uh, so that was, that was a big uh, learning moment. Uh, on the downwind, same race, then I got super aggressive, high risk, and it didn't work, and so I just, you know, put another eight bullets in front of me. And so th those were two of the same sort of mistakes where I wasn't really playing relative to one of my main premises, just be conservative, uh, uh, basics, just focusing on the basics. Dan? Yeah, I'm not sure which race. I had a couple of bad races that kind of in the middle of a race, early part yeah. of the race, but I'm not sure which three. one. This is race three. Race three, but uh, yeah, the last two, it kind of, for whatever reason, one was a bad start, but, uh, you know, I just focused on just recovery and just, 
baseball catch-up mode. I think after you know getting down the first down win and trying to position myself correctly and get around the, one of the marks clean as possible, and uh, you know just choosing a side and playing that side basically, I think that was most of what I did. Pete, anything you add to that? Well, mine, uh, mine is a, a adapt to changing circumstance. Um, rather than make a plan, my plan is to tack on the shifts and be willing to like keep my keep my head out of the boat. After, I mean, my plan is start in the middle of the line as fast as I can and be in clear air, and then just be ready to adapt as things unfold. So that's that's always been my plan. Is a sort of a no plan plan. That's a great plan. good. Right. Uh, what's my checklist? Or what, yeah, what what's your mental your thought process? Like Zach used to say, he does you know angle of heel, look for other boats. Am I going fast? What's coming down the lake? And I think there's one more thing, but you know that he ran through that checklist. Yeah, he called it his cycle. Yeah. He would keep repeating the cycle. Yeah. That's what Zach. Does. Yeah. Yeah. So checklist would be. Um, so I try not to think about going fast, um, but I'm not racing, practice my tacks. Uh, that's a good thing you can practice by yourself, uh, tacking. So it's all footwork and handwork and not stumbling across the boat. Um, so, but anyways, I like to think about, okay, if someone, I look, if someone's going faster around me, near me, uh, maybe they're in better wind, so I may need to like get over by them uh, a little closer to be in the same wind as them. Um, so I try to think about that, or maybe they're have their traveler down a little bit more, maybe like Bill's footing more than me, um, then I'll adjust myself and then put more to match his speed if it seems like he's going faster. Um, so are, are the boats going faster around me? Um, and then their checklist is, uh, am I on the lift attack? Uh, am I still in a better than normal sailing angle? And then also, what are the boats behind me doing? Because um, I don't want to, like, once I get ahead, I don't want to lose any more boats. Um, so, like, the whole fleet's going a different way, then I got to do, rethink what I'm doing. So farther you get away from the whole fleet, um, then that's, you're betting more. Um, you're really rolling the dice. Um, so I try to uh, kind of look where the fleet is going uh, if they're behind me. Um, so kind of the best case scenario is fleet follows you and the leaders, the people ahead of you, go to the other side of the course. So then you got the most leverage um, and you're also very conservative because the whole you're not going to lose any boats um, because they're all following you. Um, so kind of I like to look at okay, where are the people uh, behind me so I don't lose any boats. Um, so that's that's much. Oh, I am a boat speed guy, so I'm thinking of boat speed. And one of my big things I use is I got big ears, so I listen to my bow weight, and that's kind of my my gauge that I can hear that, especially in the smooth water and stuff that we sailed with yesterday. I mean, and it was, we didn't have motorboat traffic and stuff, and I was able, most some of the races I was able to get out there so it was you know, kind of quiet around me and get my head out of the boat, looking around, looking backwards, you know, seeing, you know, turning around again, I'm listening to that bow wave, and I can look back and see what's going on behind me. What are you listening for? Just, just that, the, you know, the, the wave that's coming off the, you know, the frequency the of side it. stay a little bit. Yeah, yeah, just that little, I don't know. For me, in tune with that, that just kind of knows, I know my boat's going when I hear that. I, I don't know. You know, like, like I said, I listen to stuff. So, um, six, six senses. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and then I'm, you know, I'm looking around and looking for pressure. The one thing I'm trying this year a little bit different, I would get hung up on watching other boats, not using them to help me, 
and I would find myself watching, kind of like Dan wow. going by on court. Wow, that's great. Well, no, I, okay, I see that. <laughs> <laughs> Information, and, you know, hopefully if that, you know, I get on that board and, and start going. So, um, looking around other boats, and uh, that's, that's kind of my checklist. Good. So, uh, my checklist is uh, before the start, maybe even before I shove off from the dock, um, I can be a little anal about it, but I'm, I want nothing in my boat that I don't want. <laughs> Two bottles of water, one Gatorade, a cliff bar. I want to make sure I got enough sunscreen on my nose, my gator on my neck, my hat's tight. <coughs> I don't wear gloves unless it's really blowing. And, and I don't want any little distraction that I can eliminate before we start. So I get rid of all of that, and then, if I've done that, then I, I, I follow Bill's lead with uh, being uh, no plan plan. Because the things are changing so <clears throat> drastically every moment that I can't imagine anybody sticks to an uh, overall game plan <coughs> before they start. So. So for me, the checklist is just going through all, and there's and there's no mental like written bullet points or anything. It's just I want to make sure that I've gone through every line on my boat and uh, and all the little things that I want to bring on board or get out of the boat. And just make sure they're all put away and then and then race so that I don't have any clutter in my mind. Hmm. Great. Boat's a fast boat. A fast boat's a happy boat. Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Just going off of what Vince said, uh, kind of do the same type of thing, but expand on a little bit, just getting off of the race course and uh, just going up the lake a little bit on both tacks is a good thing. And uh, I like to generally lake sailing or your home lake, they drop a buoy to buoy, and I always, I always do a couple of roundings around that, and you can just get a line sight on shore and check your angles. That's always a good thing to have when you're actually racing if you come around that mark and you. Check your line sight and you know if you're up or down right away. And uh, good thing to know if you should be tacking them is to come out and mark. That's, that's one thing I do. But uh, you know, pre start, just uh, try to try to always come in and do a port tack approach or try to keep keep the procedure pretty much the same before the starts and uh, try to you know, just tack the starting line from the port tack approach if I can. And mm -hmm. bigger fleets, fleets can be a little bit tougher, but still try to stick to that. Come in, right down on port. Try to find a an opening. You know, hopefully not by one of these guys, <laughs> and uh, just try to pick a whole big, big hole as possible and you know, mm -hmm. protect it a little bit on the line. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, I just look up the lake at about a minute or two before the, or two or three minutes before the start, and I try to get an idea where the next shift is coming, and, and try to set myself up on the line on the correct area. And, uh, not really have a plan because you know it's really too hard to pick a side ten minutes before the start. Yeah. And uh, you know a lot of times you just sail off the lake and you got to link link the pulse together and dock the lake and kind of keep it together that way. So Pete, you do I mean, this is one you can deal with. What's your mental thought process during a race? Well, I like all the comments that have happened here. I think. Um, whether you're in an MC class or a Melgus 20 class or an A Scout class, preparation is key. That you know, most of the most of the hard work done to win a regatta happens two days before the event starts. Um, so when you have all that stuff done, it just allows you to relax and get your head out of the boat. I think that's really important. And I, I know a number of people mentioned that a no plan plan is good, but and I think that the value of saying that is to just be able to adapt to anything that happens on the race course, but I do think there's value in having a plan. I think one of the most important things that you can know when you go out on the lake is whether or not you're sailing in a persistent shift breeze or an oscillating shift breeze, which sometimes you can tell from the weather forecast or clouds or whatever you see out there, but if you go out there thinking that you're just going to adapt to whatever shift you see and the breeze just keeps it right for a whole afternoon you're going to have to have a plan to, to deal with that you know so I think it's okay to have a plan that I want to start in the middle um, but I think it's okay to say to yourself that I really feel like the fresh puffs are all hitting from the right and that 
when I have choices to make, I'm going to protect the right if I can. I've been doing this for probably four or five years now, where um, I'm always in the fleet. I don't do it at home for club races because there's, you know, ten boats or whatever. But if I'm in a regatta, I, I'm hanging out above the line. Um, a couple reasons. One is, if there is going to be a persistent ship, as Peter said, in, in the right side or the left side is favored, you're going to see it faster and you can react to it faster. And if you want to get to that other end, if you're in the mix with, you know, 30 to up to 70 boats down below the line, you can't get from one end to the other very fast. But if you're up above the line, you can. And the other thing I like about it is, um, as far as when I come back down, never sooner than two minutes, but always more than one minute. <laughs> Before the start. <laughs> okay? So I'm, I'm never, I'm, I'm targeting about a minute and a half to a minute 20 is when I want to cross below that line and to come down from on top. Because I, I don't want to go around the ends. I want to come down where I spin and then I'm in the front row. And I want to stay in the front row. I never take a transom. I don't, well, I don't say never. I don't want to take a transom. I have occasionally. But it's, it's come down and spin, and then you're in the front row, and then you stay in the front row. And wherever that front row goes, you go with them. <laughs> and if they all go over, you all go over. But, but you stay with them at least. Um, if you feel that there is a line sag, which quite often there is, then you go ahead and you beat the boat that's a half a boat length in front of them and take a chance. Um, I had one yesterday where I looked up and there was one boat that was out in front and I said, uh, he's too far, I'm not, I'm not going to trust him. And so I hung back from him and he was, sure enough, that was the one boat that's been over so far in this regatta. So, uh, but that told me I was about a boat length behind him, he was over, I was probably close. So that was good. And anyways, but that's what I always do. I always stay up. I'm trying to teach our kids at home when they go to the ex regattas to do the same thing. Some of them are starting to pick up on it. I've been talking about it with my brother, and I notice I see him quite often up there with me, hanging out above the line. Um, DQs, I think, he's done it a few times now. No, no, no. But I just, I, I, to me, it's the best way to start. Now, I don't, I probably shouldn't say that because now everyone's going <laughs> to Everyone's going to go blind. the one concern is, oh gosh, how am I going to get back below that line, you know, am I going to find a hole? I have never had a problem finding a hole to get down. Um, again, it allows you to say, okay, I want to be in the middle, I want to be, the, I never want to be on the boat, you know, all the way to one end. And not, not, not in a regatta, I want to, want to the, the last little 10% of either line, that's for other people to get piled up in, I don't want to be there. So um, I just ignore that and then concentrate on the center 80% of the line. But uh, then you can, you can find your spot, spin, you're in the front row, and then just stay with everyone else and don't let anyone see all the time. Do you usually come down on port or starboard? It varies, but uh, quite often it's on port. Okay. Yeah, it, if, right. if I want to be more on the starboard end, then I'm coming down on port. Right. And then you spin and tack, and, and then you're in the front row, and then it's, you're right where you want to be. Yeah, I like it because you have max visibility. You can see the holes in the line where there's less boats, so you can pick your hole. Uh, more so than port approach, you have much more visibility. Um, and if you have a line sight, when you're sailing back down, downwind, uh, you're going to know when you cross the line. Um, and if you're crossing the line downwind at a minute and a half, probably there's going to be no boats on that starting line. They're, everyone's like below the line, so you're going to be able to see your line sight when you cross back down. Um, so. so, Let me add to that, this is something we teach in Zenda you a lot. There's three things, if you're really, even if you're in second place trying to get to first, it's not just last place getting to the next boat, mid-pack getting to the next boat. There's three things in MC sailing. It happens in any class in the world. Any boat, America's Cup all the way down. Three things, match angle of heel, match bow up, bow down. If, the, if someone passes you, the boat that just passed you is your teacher. Match, you're not gonna be bow down, you're not gonna be bow up. So match point, match angle of heel to marks. And then the difference in an MC between right and wrong on a main sheet is one foot. 
don't look up at your sail, don't look at the telltales, look at what's in front of you and stabilize the loss by pulling your main sheet in and out one foot until your speed stabilizes. And it's a lot more fun getting beat by 30 yards than 300 yards. And that's your goal. Your goal is to get 5-10% better with each time you go out sailing. So those three things, point, angle of heel, one foot between right and wrong in the main sheet. I would add one thing, which is my one thing when you asked that, my one thing would have been in the big fleet is clear air. Which means that if there are boats in front of you or to windward of you, like this one, um, like tack, head down, do something to be in clear air so that you can go fast. So that you can be making those little adjustments and bow up, bow up, bow up, because dirty air is just, uh, it's like you just lose ground, and sometimes you don't even realize it until it's happened, and, uh, and then, it's, then it's hard to gain it back. So, like, find, finding a clean lane, being willing to tack for three boat lengths and tack back, we were talking okay. about that, okay. is totally okay. It's totally okay to tack a little bit and then tack back so that you're in a, in a better lane. Because it's different than in Lake Harriet, we stay on a tack for a long time. <laughs>